So how many vineyards are we talking about this Sunday? Two or one or two? Or maybe a hundred and two or however many we are here. Or maybe one. It's a question that's easy to ask, but it's not so easy to answer. On the one hand, clearly it will be two vineyards. Isaiah's vineyard in the first reading dates to the 8th century BC, 700 some years before Jesus. Jesus' vineyard dates to his day in the early 30s AD, or if you'd want to stretch it to the mid 80s, if we're referring to Matthew's retelling of it in his gospel. But Jesus started out by using those same details about his vineyard that Isaiah had. The landowner plants a vineyard, puts a wall around it, digs out a wine press, and builds a tower for its protection. So that caught the ears of the, his contemporaries right away. Kind of like when we Americans hear four score and seven years ago, we hear much more than just a fancy way of saying 87 years ago. We know those words so well that right away they bring to mind that famous Gettysburg Address of Lincoln, which these words begin, that whole Civil War context. So when Jesus says, hear another parable, and starts with that precise series of details, his hearers knew right away that this was not going to be a lesson about winemaking or viticulture or whatever. It's going to be a lesson about God and his people and how they treat each other, how God has done everything for us and how our response to him is so often lacking. In other words, even though the dates are different, it's the same vineyard, it's the same story. Except that maybe in a way it's not. Because in Isaiah's vineyard, the focus was on the grapes that the vines produced. God, the owner of the vineyard, is frustrated because even though he has done everything he can do on his end, the grapevines still insist on producing only hard, bitter, wild grapes. The owner can't make the vines produce good grapes. The wild grapes are worthless. You can't do anything with them. It's all just a waste. All you can do is just tear it all down and start over again. What's the problem? Just in case we missed it, Isaiah spelled it out explicitly. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, his cherished people. He wanted them to treat each other justly, decently. But in a nice little pun at the end, he says that when he looked for that fruit that he wanted, he looked for right judgment and proper behavior, mishpat. But behold, mishpach, he sees bloodshed. He looked for justice, tzedakah. But behold, tzedakah, the outcry of those being hurt, bitter wailing. In Jesus' vineyard, by contrast, the focus is not on the grapes, but on the people who are supposed to be tending the vineyard and harvesting the grapes for the owner. If you heard my homily last week, you know the context. Matthew has collected here three parables of Jesus that make the same point. He has now reached Jerusalem, and the opposition between him and the authorities is getting more and more bitter and venomous. And now Jesus has thrown down the gauntlet to the chief priests, especially the family of Annas, who are the authorities of his people, but they are thoroughly corrupt. And he's disrupted their racket of selling the only animals that they will permit to be used for the mandatory temple sacrifices and their money changing operation and forced pilgrims from around the world to pay the temple tax only in the priest's own currency, for both of which, of course, they charged exorbitant fees. Jesus' violent overthrow of the tables of coins and causing a wild stampede of the animals all over the place with that whip of cords created a melee of chaotic violence. But the ordinary people cheer him on because they're on his side. So the next day when Jesus shows his face again in the temple, the priests would have loved to throw him in the prison and throw away the key, but they can't. He's too popular with the ordinary people because they see Jesus as a prophet and his actions as God's judgment on the whole operation of these unworthy sons of Aaron. So the priests seethe, but there's little they can do about it at this point. 
to convey this bitter opposition between Jesus and the priests that in less than a week after this is going to bring about his death. With this passage, we're now in what you and I would call Holy Week. Matthew collects these three parables in which Jesus states his case against them. Last Sunday, we heard the first. This Sunday, Jesus launches into the second of the three. And next week, we'll hear the third. By starting out today saying, hear another parable, he explicitly links the message of this parable with the one we heard last Sunday. They both make the same point. The men in charge looked all right and prosper, like the son who says, yes, sir, but then in fact does not do what his father tells him to do. Because that's exactly what these corrupt priests were doing. They were looking good, but they were not doing God's will. They were at the trough for themselves. They were not leading God's people in a way that produced the kind of fruit that God had the right to expect. And so Jesus says they're going to get sacked. In fact, they were just the latest in a whole line of authorities over his people whom power had corrupted, who in the past had killed both the former prophets and the latter prophets, and now were fixing to kill even the son whom God had sent to them. God, the owner of the vineyard, promises that they will be replaced by a group of people who will indeed produce the harvest that he wants and has every right to expect. And I have to throw in here right away that now, in this day and age, we have to be very conscious of that danger that we will interpret that, par that parable to mean that God's going to replace the Jewish people with us as his new chosen people. So it's kind of unfortunate that the lectionary compilers didn't go on to include just the next couple of verses because there it says explicitly, when the chief priests heard his parables, they knew he was speaking about them, not about the Jewish people as such. Although they were attempting to arrest him, they feared the crowds, for they, the people as such, regarded Jesus as a prophet. But to return to the main point again, does the fact that not only the Israelites of the 8th century BC, but the high priests of Annas' family who were in power in Jesus' day also are by now long gone mean that these parables are, this parable is emptied of meaning? Obviously not because the Lord still wants justice and right conduct. He still wants all his children to be treated with fundamental fairness and decency. And behold, even in our country, he still finds mishpach and se'akah, bloodshed and outcry, the protest and the wailing of those who suffer injustice. It is the same vineyard, except this time, we're the ones in charge. In a democracy, we're the ones who vote. And even far more important than that, we're the populace in popular opinion. We're the ones who go to make up that consensus about how people ought to act and treat each other in this land. You and I, who are followers of Jesus, need to be the ones who present the alternatives to the business as usual of our world. To me, it's sobering to realize how many people in our own country agree with Osama bin Laden. People will always back the stronger horse, he said. In other words, the solution to problems is to use power, force, to make people do what we think they ought to do. Jesus said the opposite of that. Instead of crucifying our enemies, he told us to take up our cross and lay down our lives for others. Someone reminded me this week of the quote from Martin Luther King, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And what that means is that maybe we each have our own part to play in these parables of the vineyard. Maybe there are 104 different mini vineyards or however many we are this morning, all components of this great one vineyard that the Lord has entrusted to us. Maybe he's giving us this opportunity this week to examine the quality of our own fruit that we're producing for him. Whether our words or actions are the ones that he wants to see or are sour and bitter, 
leading to his disappointment and frustration. Maybe we could see this weekend's reading as to be a call to stay united to Jesus, who the Gospel of John reminds us is the true vine, and live by his life force of love, bringing forth his fruit. Or maybe to change the metaphor to that of Martin Luther King, to do our best this week to live out Jesus' values as an alternative to the values of the world around us and in such a way to be a light to dispel the darkness wherever we are. Because if we all do that, cumulatively, the world will be brighter and Isaiah's song of the vineyard could be a happier tune.